It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. In a country with a free press, but also unrestrained finance, can big money scare media outlets into silence? That's the question explored in the new Netflix documentary, Nobody Speak, Trials of the Free Press. Journalism, you know, real journalism, the kind of journalism that exposes things that powerful people don't want known, is a very fragile thing. It's a very rare thing. It doesn't happen most of the time. It can disappear very easily. I have never heard or seen such outrageous vicious, distorted reporting. The world's most dishonest people are back there. Look at all the cameras going. I would never kill them. I would never do that. Ah, uh, that's sick. There was political traction to be won by essentially conducting culture war against big media. That's become a standard way of doing politics. Can you turn her microphone off, please? No. That's a clip from Nobody Speak, Trials of the Free Press, which is airing now on Netflix. Brian Knappenberger is the film's writer and director, and he joins me now. Brian, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us about this film. Well, this film started um, because I, I just found the, the Hulk Hogan Gawker case really, really compelling. Um, you know, I just thought this case was really, really interesting for all sorts of reasons. It was the first time a sex tape case like this had ever gone to trial. But beyond the kind of tabloid veneer, you could tell that there was some big picture kind of, um, you know, First Amendment versus privacy issues at stake. And my work it has, has involved both in the past. So uh, I just thought it was really interesting. But it became very different to me when it was revealed at the end. Well, first of all, the verdict, which was $140 million, uh, uh, when that came down, that verdict was so staggering. And when it was paired with a requirement for Gawker to put up $50 million right away, that was the death sentence to Gawker. So whatever you thought was going on in the trial, the ending was dramatic. It ended with Gawker essentially going bankrupt. And then the revelation that Peter Thiel, uh, Silicon Valley billionaire, uh, first outside investor of Facebook, um, co-founder of PayPal, uh, was actually funding bankrolling Hulk Hogan's case in secret. Um, then it became a very different story for me. Uh, this became a story about a, a, a grudge that Peter Thiel had against Gawker. And so I started really thinking, uh, and that's essentially when the documentary started, where, when we started really looking at um, how big money can can be leveraged behind the scenes to to silence news organizations. So, so the question you started with, can you know can big money silence a free press? I think the answer is yes. We're starting to see that in in new ways uh, right now, and that's that's what essentially what we we look at. Yeah, Brian. And just to explain for anyone who's not familiar with the Gawker case, uh, that's when the uh, wrestler known as Hulk Hogan sued Gawker after they published a sex tape uh, of his. And it emerged later on that um, the billionaire, as you mentioned, Peter Thiel, was funding Hogan's suit in a bid to put Gawker out of business, which it successfully did. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, it was it was uh, it, it was already a strange trial with uh, in the courtroom with twists and turns, but um, that staggering verdict followed by this bizarre revelation that that Peter Thiel was actually the one who was sort of pulling the strings, you know, behind the scenes. Um, that made this a very very. That was not only a strange story turn. Uh, it, it, it was a, it brought up some really I think critical and. Um, you know, troubling sorts of dynamics. Well, let's talk about those, those dynamics. What troubled you most about it? The secrecy. I mean, the short answer to that is the secrecy. Also, by the way, we, I'm sure we'll get to this Sheldon Adelson aspect. We, we cover the Sheldon Adelson secretive purchase of the Las Vegas Review Journal. But in both cases, uh, and in the, in, the, in the case of Peter Thiel, it's the secrecy that, that bothered me. Um, you know, people have pointed out that, um, that uh, you know, other organizations have, have, you know, engaged in this project, uh, this, this, um, uh, this tactic of litigation financing, right? The ACLU does this, Greenpeace does this, Sierra Club does this, they pick a case and they come down on one side of the case. Um, and they do that to make a political point. Presumably that's what Mr. Teal was doing. But what, what he did was he did this in secret. Um, this is something that actually used to be illegal 
in this country up until the 50s, all the way back to common law. Uh, that is the secretive funding of a, of a lawsuit in order to sort of for your own ends. Um, and so that's, that secretive part was, was disturbing. Apparently that was, uh, was, these laws were called champerty laws and they were overturned in the late 50s because um, the NAAC was, was creating a lot of, um, was, was filing lawsuits in order to end segregation. So the opponents to uh, the NAACP wanted to get the NAACP to reveal their uh, donors list. Um, so, but that's very different than what Peter Thiel did. You understood it was the NAACP, just as you understand it's the ACLU or the Sierra Club now. You get it. There's transparency there. Not so here. Okay, you mentioned uh, Sheldon Adelson and the Las Vegas Review Journal, and I want to get to that in a second. But just staying on the Hulk Hogan, uh, Peter Thiel, Gawker case, my problem with this case is that I do think Gawker had something to be held accountable for. They published a sex tape. Uh, of Hogan, uh, which, uh, you know, is his private life. And also, they had outed Peter Thiel uh, as being gay against his wishes, as they did later on with other, with other people who had even way less of a public profile. So in looking at this case, did you see any uh, grounds for either Hogan or Thiel or, or anybody else having a valid complaint against Gawker? Yes, uh, 100%. But... What Bert, and that's actually one of the things that got me in, interested in the case in the beginning. This isn't an easy case. I didn't pick this or wasn't, I don't think, initially compelled by this case because it was easy. Um, I did it because it was complex. Uh, you know, the, and, and by the way, I had been a, and, and done previous work that was very much um, advocating for privacy, um, you know, especially around laws in terms of mass surveillance and mass suspicionless surveillance, that sort of thing. Um, so... So this wasn't an easy case, but I think the most important cases aren't necessarily easy when it comes to free speech or civil liberties. I mean, they don't always exist in that kind of center uh, area where there's crystal clear difference between heroes and villains. You know, they're, they're on the fringes, and I do think this was on the fringes. But the, the thing, the idea that they may have done something uh, wrong or, that, or even that, that Hogan deserved a payout uh, does not... Uh, compute for me with the idea that they should be silenced completely, um, uh, totally taken offline, given the death penalty, uh, especially in a country that privileges free expression. One of the things that Peter Thiel said about Gawker is that they were a singularly sociopathic bully. Uh, that's, the, that's his phrase. Um, and I think that's absurd if you look at our media environment. Um, you know, if you look at um, the kinds of things this, that we've seen in the last year. I mean, you have Alex Jones or somebody like that, you know, actually calling the Sandy Hook murders a false flag operation. You know, you have these, uh, you have things happening on Facebook where there's a live murder and stuff. I mean, the, the notion that that Gawker should be taken offline completely for this. Alex Jones, by the way, is getting, I guess, um, press credentials to the White House. Um, so, I mean. The notion that they were taken offline completely for this, I think, is what's troubling. And and the idea and the way that it was done, um, there's no reason. Uh, there, there's nothing about this case that would that makes it unique to Gawker. It could be um, it could be used by anybody with a lot of money to silence any news organization. Yeah, and just to uh, explain to people, Gawker was taken offline because the jury in this case awarded Hogan more than 140 million dollars, which is a staggering. Some and uh, Gawker essentially was forced to shut down and disband and then sell itself off to a bigger company which runs it now but without the website Gawker. And as someone who follows media, uh, especially Gawker, is a, is a Gawker's absence is very glaring, even though I thought some of its material was pretty vile. So, yeah, in terms of what kind of precedent this case and the damages awarded sets, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about the implications of that. Well, I think, uh, to me, I think this has um, um, uh, emboldened people to sue news organizations. Uh, you know, I think if you look at, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of wild what we're seeing now, even in the last couple of months. I mean, you have uh, Cole Magnate um, suing John Oliver uh, for satire, um, you know, trying to take them offline, trying to get John Oliver to stop, apparently, uh, to stop airing his show while it's being worked out. Uh, very, very aggressive. You have um, someone like 
Sarah Palin, who's also using some of the same Hogan lawyers uh, that that he used uh, to sue the New York Times. You have this environment where um, it's becoming obvious that you can kind of use the criminal justice system and wield it in this way. And even if your case has no merit, like the coal magnate's case does not have merit against John Oliver, you know, I, I mean, you know, satire is protected in this country uh, and it sh as it should be. Um, it doesn't really matter. It can wear down a news organization uh, to the point where, um, you know, it can be taken offline. One of the cases that was that was settled against Gawker at the same time as the Hogan case uh, was a case um, uh, brought by this this guy, Shiva Ayudarai, who claims to have invented email. And uh, Gawker and others have cast suspicion on that, have said that, that uh, there's evidence to suggest that he hadn't. Um, and so he sued Gawker. He couldn't, apparently couldn't find a lawyer, had trouble finding a lawyer until he found the same uh, lawyer that was used in the Hulk Hogan's case. Um, that guy, Shiva, is, is still um, suing uh, TechDirt, which is a great site, Silicon Valley site that questions Silicon Valley power. Um, and, uh, you know, TechDirt, as great as they are, they're, they're small, and he's, they're being sued for $15 million. Um, and they're in a fight for their existence. So I, I think that, you know, we're, we're looking at a period of time in which, in which um, people are emboldened by that kind of decision. Okay, so speaking of emboldened, let's get to Sheldon Adelson, who you mentioned earlier, the uh, billionaire casino magnate, uh, Republican donor, and how he came to purchase the Las Vegas Review Journal. Uh, yeah, so so we tell that story in the in the film. Uh, we recognize that there were some kind of similarities there. Um, you know, uh, essentially what happened is the reporters at the Las Vegas Review Journal were all called into a big meeting, and they were told um, they were told that their paper had been purchased by somebody that they had a new boss, which of course is intriguing to anybody in any company. Um, and the first thing they asked was, well, who, what's our new boss and what their, what's their expectation? What are their expectations? And they were told, uh, you know what, don't worry about it. You know, they want you to keep doing your job. Um, they don't necessarily need you to know who, who bought the paper. And of course, the reporters, I mean, you know, they, they, they didn't consider abiding by that for, I think on the walk back to their offices, they decided they were going to figure it out. Um, you know, it's important to know what they're, who owns the, uh, especially a newspaper. So um, uh, we tell the story of how they, they went about finding that out, which is, you know, which is, had some real stakes for them because they, uh, this was their boss that they were trying to uncover. Yeah, and one of the consequences of that is you have uh, people resigning, including a columnist, John Smith, who was told after Adelson, um, after Adelson bought the paper, that he could no longer write about about Adelson. That's right, and um, and he, um, I think, rightly uh, and courageously said, uh, "I think it's time to part ways." Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, we've heard stories, uh, all sorts of stories of their uh, of their influence on that paper. Um, you know, and and that's that's sad because that you know the the Las Vegas Review Journal is a critical and very really important paper in the West. Um, uh, especially not just in Nevada, but, but you know, but so, um, you know, I think that's what's that's what's at stake. It, it's been, you know, there's stories of their influencing uh, news stories and things that and story, especially that involve Adelson. But you know, it, again, what really um, I found the most troubling was the secretive element of it. What was going on in secret in the beginning, um, you know. It's not that wealthy individuals haven't owned newspapers before. Obviously, they have. Um, but, you know, usually that's a point of sort of civic pride. You know who it is. Uh, even someone like Bezos, who bought the, the uh, Washington Post, um, you know, and, and by the way, he's had what is by all accounts a kind of traditional stewardship of that paper. Uh, you know, you have to watch that. You have to see how the the... The Washington Post covers, you know, for instance, the Amazon purchase of Whole Foods. Um, but right to explain, and just to explain that Bezos owns yeah. Amazon. Yeah, so Bezos owns Amazon. And they just acquired Whole Foods. So, so yeah, it, I think that's a deal that requires some critical, a critical look, uh, or at least a skeptical look by um, by savvy reporters. So, so I think you have to watch 
how they cover that. But you can't do that if you don't know who bought the paper at all, who owns the paper, uh, and, and who's pulling the strings. That's where this starts to get very, kind of more dangerous for, um, for the public opinion. Brian, can we talk a bit more about this uh, Las Vegas R Review Journal columnist, uh, John Smith? Because his story, personal story with Adelson is fascinating. It involves essentially being bribed, including over his daughter's medical bills for cancer, right? Yeah. So he wrote, this isn't, this isn't something that he wrote in the Las Vegas Review Journal. He wrote a, a book called Sharks in the Desert that covered the origins of Nevada. It's actually a really good book. Um, that it, it, it's looking at the sort of, um, you know, the early days of, of uh, Las Vegas all the way up to the kind of corporate era. And, and he had, as you would have to, included uh, a section on, on Adelson. And um, Adelson took exception to one of the things that he said and then basically sued him. And uh, John uh, L. Smith happened to be uh, in the hospital with his daughter um, who had brain cancer. Um, when he got the call that he was being sued uh, over a line in the book, um, you know, for, for $10 million. And so uh, that was a very, very difficult time for him. He recounts it in the, in the, in the movie. Uh, it's very moving, actually. And, and, um, and, he's, and there are all sorts of, uh, uh, he says, and as he says in the film, there are all sorts of uh, behind-the-scenes kind of deals that, that uh, are, at one in particular that, um, in which Adelson, um, through an intermediary, an uh, intermediary allegedly tries to give him money for his daughter's um, medical expenses if he says that he libeled him. Uh, so, um, you know, it just gives you a sense of how how vicious this can be. And speaking of vicious, uh, Brian, let's end with uh, Donald Trump. Um, you uh, tie the movie. Uh, tie the dynamic you explore in the movie to this age that we're in of the Trump era. Uh, he's been openly confrontational, to say the least, towards the media. Can you talk about uh, what you think Trump signifies uh, for the dynamic that you explore inside your film about the uh, influence of big money over media? Yeah, well, a lot. He, he was woven into our film even before he won. Um, you know, I. It was pretty clear, you know, when you're watching this trial in in Florida, that in some ways the media was on trial. You know, um, that there was a real kind of uh, hatred of the media that that emerged from that trial. And of course, that was at the beginning of of Donald Trump's rise through the Republican Party, and then eventually to the White House. Uh, that was fueled by a kind of hatred or an attacks on the media, uh, at least in part. So. You saw this kind of dynamic um, showing itself, um, but you know, look, uh, we always kind of knew that there was a kind of echo happening here on a on a national scale. Um, it, you know, Trump, uh, obviously a very thin-skinned um, billionaire himself, who is uh, not afraid to to enact lawsuits. USA Today did a. Uh, um, uh, some great reporting actually during the campaign where they, they looked at the 3,500 lawsuits uh, that Donald Trump was involved with in one way or another. So, um, so he fit the bill. And, and of course, you know, the day after the election, even though we'd cut a bunch of sections with Trump, it was, it was uh, you know, we realized we had a very kind of different film. Um, it, it, when, you know, now that this guy who had talked about opening up libel laws, who had spent so much of the campaign pointing at the press, the row of cameras, calling them scum, calling them uh, terrible people, uh, blacklisting them from various um, rallies and speeches, you know, from getting cre press credentials to his rallies and speeches, um, you know, really doing a lot. Now he was in charge of the executive branch and and uh, and and trying to get our head around what that could mean. Um, and of course, we've just seen a, just a very very hostile relationship between him and the press, and that's been based mostly on lies, a kind of wall of deception coming out of the White House. The film is Nobody Speak: Trials of the Free Press, and Brian Knappenberger is the film's writer and director. Brian, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.